what's the best way and the cheapest way to pay for what you need. You pay for it one way or another. But, but, okay, but, but what, then why is the open source community in the world growing so fast? I, I it's think it's growing understand. in certain areas. It's not it's growing, growing in the it's not so, growing in the ERP area. I totally see where this is going, going to go, and frankly, I have a uh, license to the bar next uh, across the street, and, and this will go, and, and that's, that's where at least party, party continues there, okay, after this session. So, with that said, now question is, if you bring this back, and frankly, this was a very interesting debate, and a healthy debate on, yes, this is the utopic version of what you think should happen, and you are, uh, Brenna is actually sharing the realism on what is possible and what can be done within the boundaries. Now, if, if that's the mindset that we are gonna keep, should we say that everything that Phil said today is the Star Trek version of what City can accomplish? And Laura, I'm gonna to come to you to say that if you were to stand outside, say you are not working in the position you are and think like a citizen. Do you think like a city which has Phil's vision manifested would really benefit significantly more than the realism that Brenna City delivers today? Well, a smart city would benefit the citizens a lot more. Absolutely, no, no doubt about it. I think the challenge is, is how do we get to a smart city? Um, so we've got some examples of smart communities, you know, we've got international examples, um, and part of what we've already discussed is what we have to overcome. How do we overcome our legacy investments and move um, towards these investments? Um, one idea that I came up with as we were talking is we need a fellows program for government. We need um, mm -hmm. fellows. And so if we had the university sponsor fellows who could work in these areas in government, if we had um, companies like IBM and Microsoft and others that are here who sponsored fellows, we could meet some of this IT gap situation that we have. And you see we have the innovation, we have the leadership. We just need to match up with the talent and time. And if we make that collective, collective investment, maybe that's an outgrowth of the Technology Information Summit, is we have Technology Information Summit fellows that are sponsored by the partners here, right? And then that way we can continue to grow talent, grow talent here in Chicago, invested in the infrastructure, because the city deals with the infrastructure. We deal, the rest of us deal with what we put on that infrastructure and, and, and what we run along. But the city deals with that basic infrastructure. That, that's the city and the county government, that's what they do. They build the infrastructure, and then we get to live quality life around it. Um, so we all have a need to invest in it. So I'm sorry I took off my citizen hat, and well, that's okay. So if you have to, if you have to maintain yourself as a citizen, yeah. you're so in depth with it. So I'm going to come to Mark. Let me, let me add a cool okay, go ahead. Final thing there, because I think that as what Phil said is utopia. But we have to realize that all citizens across the um, a country, if you will, don't need to know everything that uh, that 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 each city um, has to offer. In other words. You have to do a cost benefit. Is it beneficial for someone in Florida to know how the city of Chicago's, uh, 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 you know, to, to look in the city of Chicago and know how uh, uh, to pay a ticket up here? Maybe they may travel up here once, uh, you know what I'm saying. Is it cost beneficial for someone in California to be able to do something in Chicago? So when you had talked about open architecture, you're talking about all the systems interfacing, all this information, Will it benefit, will the cost, will the benefit outweigh the cost of putting something like that in place? So what happens is, you look at specific things that benefit people throughout. Integrated criminal justice. The FBI needs to know something that's occurring uh, throughout the country. 9-11, for example, you know, brought integrated criminal justice to focus because they need to know if you're committing a crime in California. Or, so you look at the different systems that are most beneficial to all of the citizens of the country, and then you work on those, because there are some that's just simply are not necessary. You understand? Court systems may be one, one of those, because you want to know what kind of court cases, especially if you're doing that background check, uh, that sort of thing. So I just wanted to add that. No, very good. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Now, Mark. You've been very intently listening. I was watching your body language. You were soaking in a lot of dialogue that was going on. <coughs> Are these guys making sense? Yes. 
Okay. <laughs> That's a good combination, one word, right? Okay. If you were to get a few questions which were still not answered with respect to budget, control, and the growth, and how it ties back to any technology, yes, big data is the case today, but any technology, what is still left unanswered and what is still puzzling? What's on? Uh, I'm Mark Townsend at IBM. Um, well, they've talked a lot about the barriers, which I totally appreciate. We haven't even talked about all of them. Um, so one thing, like laws, you know, laws, mandates push things out there, and sometimes decisions get made that are, have to be very short-sighted. So um, we haven't talked about that one. Um, that might be interesting to talk about some more. All right, so it's going to take well, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Um, um, every, you know, we have federal laws. There, there, there are federal laws that everyone, you know, everyone has to adhere to. But every state has their own individual laws, and our my court system is built based upon the laws of the state of Illinois. And so, and 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 the city of Chicago is governed by uh, many ordinances that have been created by their local, their local city council, as well as those various suburbs. They create their own ordinances. So uh, different things apply to different uh, uh, people. So the you know having that uh, uh, the ability for someone in a different state to do something here just doesn't always make sense. If, for instance, uh, our expungement law, the expungement laws in, in the city of in Illinois are, are pretty great laws, and we do an expungement summit every year. Well, I have people across the country calling me about how to put on an expungement summit. And so first you have to look at your laws and see whether or not you even have uh, things that are expungible, nonviolent offenses, et cetera, that are expungible. I'm talking to someone in Utah. As a matter of fact, I thought Utah would have worse expungement laws, and I looked at their laws the other day so I could prepare for the meeting. They have better. Expungement laws uh, than we do. Uh, so, yes, you have to definitely because we're government and we're governed by the law. So. All right, so I'll ask this lady who wanted information. <laughs> Teresa, based on what you're saying here, do you think you are getting a clear idea that if you were to come into office and try to use big data to get the growth and the budget controls? Do you have the steps that they are taking, and perhaps you understand they are taking, to make that happen effectively? Uh, yes, this is where, uh, and I put this on my uh, summation when I uh, ordered this uh, event today, was that to more or less put a partnership together, be it within the community itself, about leaders that we could come together and, and present to the team up there about you know future and tomorrows and how we could effectively assist with cost control and yet give some thought leadership in the directions for you. So my question still remains, are they clear in the way they are all collectively answering the question? Yes, they are. Okay, by show of hands, and this is validation required because you are the bosses. These people are serving you with education and information. Do you feel right now you have clarity? Or if there's a question, please raise your hand with respect to budget and budget control and the growth and where big data ties in. So do I take, if no hands are raised, that means we have clarity or there should be a question? This is the time. I now see, this is how you prompt people to Raise your hand. Okay, for you. Okay, go ahead. My name is Sohina Hafiz, and I'm from Ascent Innovations. We are partners with Microsoft. I strongly believe if we have to deliver the best solution, we should get best talent, right talent on board. Only then we can uh, deliver the best solution. And uh, the key source is the colleges, universities. So we have to bring in interns because they are so enthusiastic, they are so passionate, and we will be utilizing these students. We will also be laying foundation for future. So I strongly think that we have to. And we ourselves, since we believe 100% in this, we go to colleges. We have intern programs. We, go, we, we participate in career fairs. 
we communicate with the college you know, the staff, the right staff, to direct us to the students. So I think um, that really helps, and we should focus on this. And I, I think uh, Brenna did mention, and uh, the Dr. E. Brown also mentioned, that uh, you have uh, worked out with the uh, union, and uh, you know, that's really good. That, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Sure. Now, coming to the, the roadblocks and taking a devil's, a devil's advocate view, if you have compliance regulations, and they've been created by human beings like us, and now we want to use big data and maybe strive towards making that utopic world that Phil mentioned. And in that process, whether the processes are there, the compliance and the regulations exist, which slow us down or in some cases prevent us completely in going a certain direction. Would there be a way by which we fundamentally look at the regulations, which in turn will help us ease or pave the path for us being able to effectively use technologies which are today and maybe coming tomorrow? I think we need like a GAO office for technology so that our legislators who are representing residents can understand what the impact is. So for example, as they're creating legislation, as they're drafting it, as they're trying to respond to citizens' requests, they have a technical group that they can go to. Maybe it's a citizen group, maybe it's not a government group, that says, hey, what impact is this going to have? How do I make this legislation more effective? How do I make this legislation um, leverage existing platforms now so that I'm not creating something that is not going to really do what I want it to do, generate revenue for a child support partner, whatever it is that the citizens have asked for. And so if we have that centralized place that helps you know, support the legislators, represent their constituents, as we're making these laws, we understand the impact, we understand how much it actually costs to collect this revenue, we understand that. Um, that's a partnership that we can do, um, and that's a cooperation given the assets we have in this city and this region that we have. So, uh, Jeevan, coming to you, compliance and regulations, you must have tried to present proposals and or concepts or proof of concepts for things getting done. What were the typical roadblocks in terms of compliance or <coughs> red tape per se, but close to it, which would prevent you from getting big data to deliver the results, or any technology, and yes, big data is there, but any technology to give you the results, or them the results. So you tell them, help me help you remove the roadblocks. Be a leader, right? I think um, you know when you go into designing some technology, one of the big things is, what is the requirement? What do you need, right? If that is not there, then it slows the process. Getting, we get the RFPs, and I work with my counterparts in the account teams to respond to RFPs, and by the time we respond, as Dorothy said, by the time everything is decided, technology has changed, and they feel that the impact is low. So I think, I think it's, a, it's a requirement, and um, there's the vision is there, the leadership is there, new people are coming in, that's bringing in the vision, as okay, here's what I need, here's the requirements. If you don't have the requirements, things slow down, number one. Number two is, if you don't have the requirements, we can, like companies like Datalink can do analysis and assessment to figure out where you are, map that with where you need to be, and what needs to be done to get there. So I have the requirement. Let's start with that. We have clearly defined requirements. Let's give some credit. I bet you don't. No. Okay. I never do. <laughs> all right. So, so the point I'm trying to make here is suppose eventually after all the black sweat and equity and everything that was spent to finally define the requirement, and it comes to say, we are going to be looking to implement X, Y, Z. We want to go that path and suddenly from comes left field a bunch of regulations or compliance related issues. Are there any situations like these? I, there might be in your world, so I'll let her speak to that in a second. In my world, so I have some hiring regulations and then I have all the procurement regulations that I think is what we're going to talk about on the next panel but I don't have any regulations that impede the types of technology that I can implement. So the decisions that I'm making in terms of technology strategy are all about what I think is the right direction for the city. I agree, so technology totally agree, no regulations. Right. But technology is a means to an end. So you're trying to put in an initiative which will allow perhaps more data, more clarity, more visibility into a set of data points which was otherwise not available and suddenly privacy kicks in. 
suddenly uh, yes. HIPAA kicks in. Some 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 other regulations kick in. Absolutely. And, and yep. Things like HIPAA and FERPA and CJIS, et cetera, are behind the curve. I think Phil would have an interesting perspective. So behind the curve in terms of what other countries are doing related to privacy and designing solutions that reflect what we can do with data today. And having a perspective of how you protect privacy and openness in the design of a solution in reflection of the amount of data available is possible. And our current federal regula regulations around privacy don't reflect that. But I don't know that that's something we can solve at the state or city or county level. That's a federal issue that we can even I'll just say um, one thing on compliance. So, HIPAA and uh, you know sovereigns obviously and things like that. I don't see that as an, an impediment. Those are necessary requirements to actually make sure that there's some sort of a, a regulation in place. What technology companies that I work with do is they go proactively and make sure that the products that they offer are compliant with either HIPAA or SOX or whatever <coughs> compliance requirements for that industry is. If it's healthcare, the products that we put out there need to be compliant with that. Privacy is an important thing, and the definition of what privacy means keeps changing as more and more things come. So we'll, we'll meet that. I, I think that's not the, the challenge when we work with, you know, the public sector is not that there is compliance. It's uh, more the, you know, budgets always were constrained. We have the requirements are constrained. We always didn't meet the compliance requirements that the public sector needs. So that's not a challenge at all. So uh, Dorothy, what data privacy or, or if there was more data available on a certain thing or more visibility available, Somebody gets jitters because of that. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. We, you know, I have to adhere to to local court rules. I have to adhere to Supreme Court rules. And I have to adhere to uh, 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 state statutes. All of those when I'm implementing uh, many things. Um, the the our electronic filing system, for instance, our Supreme Court, we could not go live with with electronic filing until our Supreme Court issued standards and policies that the entire state and you know all the clerks of courts had to adhere to. We could not implement that. Now we have a, a, a public access policy. I cannot put a document out online for you to see because the Supreme Court, Illinois Supreme Court actually says no. So what they've done though is to start to try to put in place a a policy where all litigants uh, would have to actually redact to the last four digits, so security numbers, etc., all personal identifying information, my, minors' names, uh, birth dates, etc. And they just recently had a hearing, uh, and many people came to the hearing, uh, including some 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 of the judiciary, and said that, "Oh, we need this information immediately, so we really don't need it to be redacted." So. You can't go forward until you have hearings, et cetera. Uh, and so there's just so many things that uh, I have to adhere to before I can actually put the information on the internet. And you can get things on the internet everywhere, but court data, uh, for instance, with divorces, people put their social security numbers, their, their birthdays, their credit cards, all of that in their filings for divorce. So do you want that out there for identity theft? No, you do not. So the Supreme Court is in charge of that. And people ask me all the time, why can't I just go to your website and just pull the, uh, a copy of that document from there? I can't do it because I'm not authorized to do it by the Illinois Supreme Court. So yes, for my office, there are a lot of things that prevent me from being able to put in, or either utilize the technology that I already have available. I can put out there tomorrow if I have authority, uh, authorization to do so. Hi, my name is Daryl Henry, I'm from DPI. I have a question regarding uh, the benefits of technology and or process uh, improvements versus the politics of implementing those, right? I.e., <laughs> here's great news, this new technology that we're implementing is going to um, allow us to cut, you know, 25% of the workforce in this department. The bad news is the politics says that's never going to happen. So, so how do you manage to do that? That's a great question. Anybody? So who's going to take that answer? Two <laughs> <laughs> volunteers here. Well, you know, there's a there's a, a myth also 
that uh, technology reduces staff immediately. It just does not happen. Um, you, you're you going to need people to actually run the machines, to, to, to implement the technology, to do the work. That's the begin. that's the first thing. And, and I always say uh, that in the long run, because there's a transition phase, you can't just stop something today and start something else tomorrow. It just doesn't happen. That's all part of that business uh, process re-engineering that I talked about. And it takes a, takes a little time. So that I generally try to use attrition to, and, uh, to, to try to um, um, make the changes that occurs. Um, you know, so, and, and, and for me, uh, coming from the uh, private sector into this office, I really didn't have a lot of, a, a, you know, I didn't have um, accountability or responsibility to, um, to, to hold on to anybody, as a matter of fact. So I have a, I'm in a better position to make those kind of decisions if, in fact, I need to make them. But the process uh, itself um, hinders me and just being, being very um, careful about how something is implemented to make sure that I'm not you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Other words. <laughs> Do we have a question? This is Ellen Berry. Uh, having been on both sides of the coin, both public sector and private sector, I think the conversation this morning is really quite interesting. It's quite easy for people from the outside of government to tell government how easily we should be doing things. And the first example that comes to mind today, to me, is the venture card system, a venture card system with the CTA where external resources were engaged with some very good, very current technology with an expectation that it was going to go flawlessly. It has gone in. It has problems. It has issues. Not surprising to those of us that have worked public sector and knowing that you need a backup plan, which they've done, which is to go back to where they've been for a few minutes, hang in there for a while until the external resource can get the system straight. So it's easy to project what we should be doing it's not quite so easy to fulfill all the requirements that people are asking us to do instantaneously. But it is great fun. And as I've always said to my staff, if it were easy, they wouldn't need us. <laughs> so we're here to try to work through all of this. Thank you. So right now when it comes to making government use predictive, I mean, OK, technology is there, but to become predictive, what is it that's expected? from the people at the top and also the citizens? Um, so from the top, I'm going to guess you mean the mayor. Um, so he expects um, me to drive predictive analytics into every department in the city. Um, he wanted that done probably sometime last week. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer than that. It, some departments are very, very ready. Um, you know, the health department, because they have a history of epidemiology, et cetera, they're very data savvy. Um, they're somewhat, and they also sort of, right, being run by doctors, they, they understand that proactive medicine is cheaper than emergency medicine, and they run their department that way. So they're ready for predictive analytics. Um, other departments are less so, so it takes a little bit longer. But the mayor's vision for um, city service delivery is that every service that we deliver can be made better by predictive um, data-driven decision making and we have a three to four year plan to engage with every department to make that the case um, we let the departments decide the best place to do that uh, we do that in partnership because the data is more ready in some places than others um, to share a quick antidote at the moment we're working on we like to talk about rats but we're a water born city have rats, hopefully you don't see them. Um, but we're working with the Department of Streets and Sanitation to make our um, our rat baiting process in the city um, more predictive and proactive so that instead of calling 311 to tell the city you've seen a rat, which leads to a process of rat baiting that is threefold, um, the process will become more predictive driven by close to 15 years of data that predicts where rats are in the city. Um, which will lead to extensive cost savings and and actually rather than your question, rather than shrinking that team, we'll actually do more rat baiting with the with the uh, with the budget that we have. So instead of spending more, we will do more with the money that we can make money off a citizen app. Yeah. Yes. Right. Where, where are the rats? Right. <laughs> the, the goal there is actually so we want the city to have
have rats, right? You don't want to ever get rid of all the rats because the rats eat other things. You don't want to. <laughs> um, I know more about this than I ever wanted to. Um, so we don't actually want anyone to ever see a rat again and have to call 311, right? That's the goal. So five years and hopefully never will have to get rid of the rats. So that's, that's uh, Brenner's response to being predictive. Now, Phil, coming to you, and we'll wrap up after this, is if you were to get $500 or maybe 1000 bucks an hour type of consulting, I'm just motivating you to give the right answer. <laughs> and realistic. What specific three things that you will suggest for the government officials, the citizens, to everyone to come together and actually make the best use of this big data technology to become predictive, to cut costs, and to foster growth? Thousand bucks per hour at stake. Oh, right. Thank you. The, um, the number one goal that I see the value from big data tools is the consolidation of data from disparate sources. So not changing all the source systems because that's a nightmare, but consolidate data because the value of the data is only there when it's consolidated. So um, that means you've got to collaborate with all your different cities and municipalities across the state or maybe other states and start to consolidate data with the right security, the right controls, but that's the name of the game is consolidation. Uh, that may be possible in certain areas, and uh, hopefully it progressively can be. Once you, have, once you have consolidation, then you can start to look at the analytics uses of that consolidation, as well as the service to citizens, uh, because it is now a consolidated view. I could have my timeline, my Facebook timeline, you know, in the life of the government. I could have it if I wanted, if I wanted. Um, but, but consolidation and then the use of these tools to give views into that for people to consume internally in the government or, or, um, or citizens. Those are the easiest steps. They're not easy, but they are the easiest steps and the good uses for these technologies. All right. 30 seconds each. Three words allowed. Talk three words that come to mind which you feel should be utilized as the driving force for each leader in government and in the technology departments in order for them to get the best out of this big data technology in the interest of budget control and growth. Starting with you, Laura. Identify the indicators. This was a phrase, but I'll give you that. We needed three words. <laughs> All right, Jim. This might be overused too many times, but uh, it's not it's not just a technology problem. It's a people that need to adapt. As Dorothy said, the process that is around needs to change uh, to make some of these things happen. And the last piece of the puzzle is technology. This is overused all the time, but all three need to adapt to actually make this happen. Everybody can talk about the problems. You're a consultant, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, what I was saying was, we can always talk about the problems, but we have to start somewhere. Great. Thank you. Data-driven decisions. <laughs> Service, accessibility, and transparency. Somebody should be able to do the problem to work. Reduce duplication, consolidate. <laughs> Great. Now, thank you so much, uh, all of our panelists, Phil, Dorothy, Brenna, Jeevan, and Laura. And a bigger thanks to all the audience who were patiently sitting, enjoyed some of the interesting debates we had, and some of the good questions that you asked. If you have any other further questions, these people are out there, and the party continues at the bar after 5 p.m., uh, 5 p. and dedicated drivers are provided. Thank you so much.